Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So this is another episode of the C. Bailey cast, the brand new little YouTube podcast where we talk to really interesting people about Blender, 3D art and filmmaking and how to survive online uh, as an artist. That's uh, kind of the topics that we want to try and discuss uh, through these little interviews and stuff. So hope you're excited today. Um, I've got Aaron from Arendelle, the YouTube channel on today. We're going to talk about his experience in Blender and some of the stuff that he does and uh, just kind of, you know, ramble a little bit about the future of Blender and how it pertains to geometry nodes and all the node systems that are coming um, and uh, and what that means for us, especially around learning things like math and uh, getting up to speed on all the, uh, the the complicated stuff that we need to know to succeed. So let me, um, let's go ahead and get Aaron on. There we go. G'day, Aaron. Welcome. Hello. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for doing the show. I appreciate <laughs> you giving me your time to come on, your oh, willingness to you. be interviewed and um, I think just share your wisdom with all these uh, all these cool people that we got today. Um, so I, I wanted to kick things off and and just find out from you a little bit how you got started with Blender and uh, and YouTube. Well, two very different times. So I started Blender when I was like way, way younger. Uh, my big brother, I got, my brother's five years older than me and he was like into tech and art and design and things. And then uh, when he was in secondary school, he was learning a piece of software called Pro Desktop, which is like CAD software, kind of like Pro Engineer. Um, but me being like nine, 10 years old, I was like, that seems cool and fun. <laughs> so he taught me that. That was like my first 3D modeling package. And then being that age, uh, I decided I was going to make video games and then trying to make video game assets in a CAD in CAD software is like it doesn't oh, really work that way that sounds painful so, oh. I know right <laughs> <laughs> and then uh yeah so somebody introduced me to Blender and this was like 2.49b if you've ever used any of these older ones they've got like the bar at the bottom they're not intuitive you don't know how good you've got it now so that was kind of that was my introduction to Blender as a as a younger person, and then it's just kind of been a more or less a constant. I think there have been a few years where I left doing three D, um, but every time I've been like, oh, I just really need to like make this thing or see what something would look like, or even when it's like, oh, I, you know, like when you rearrange your room as a kid, and it's like <laughs> hmm, I I could make this in three D and just like try it first. So I do nice. stuff like that, and then. Yeah, it was when I was at uni that I really started pushing it and being like, actually, I really want to do this. I want to do 3D. I want to do ArcViz. So my degree is interior design. Um, and yeah, it just became like more and more useful to be able to visualize things and especially for like selling stuff to clients. So yeah, it was just kind of pushing that. And then I graduated end of, well, August last year. Um, Congratulations. And I oh, thank you so much. Uh, glad glad to be out of it and then so i started my youtube in april of last year uh and yeah just sort of been i've been pushing it since then i'm i really love teaching i think like that's sort of where i've come around to as well kind of going into blender and youtube as being like oh we can do maths and we can make stuff and we can do things in this like really measured way uh but then at the same time being like oh i actually really enjoy teaching and interacting with people and having that kind of feeling of uh, sort of passing something on rather than just feeding the money mill with doing design stuff. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's motivation. good timing too. I mean, like your, cause your content, especially, you know, you've got a really strong focus on understanding the maths behind stuff, like, or at least using maths to do uh, really interesting things with these node groups. And there's kind of this core group of you guys sort of around November that sort of pop up and I felt like this past November was this really cool, like resurgence, a couple of really strong channels, you know, stuff like what you were doing, um, you know, just 3d things, his channel, like the, uh, the kind of, I don't know, I feel like it's sort of a fringe group of blender YouTube artists that are suddenly, I think going to be very mainstream, uh, because I know for me, you know, my channels, you know, kind of fringe, like we've only, we've got, we have a similar size, uh, subscriber base, but mm -hmm. you know, for me coming from a different angle and stuff, uh, you know, I, I was going to your channel to learn, you know, and I, that's, I think that was really exciting for me because the stuff I saw you doing with nodes was, 
just next level. Like I'd never really thought to even use the math nodes, you know, in, <laughs> in shaders. Like it just had not occurred to me as something relevant. I'm like, why would I do math? I need a color ramp. I'm done. You know, and I, you know, I would get all these comments in my YouTube videos about, you know, map range node. Why aren't you using the map range node? You know, linear color blend. What are you doing? And uh, it was, uh, you know, a bit of a bit of an eye opener that there's this whole other world. Uh, I feel like you guys are really jumping onto it. So let me let me ask next. So okay, you've got a, you've got a bit of a, a classical. Do you have any classical art training? Like, because you've got you've got some skills when it comes to drawing. Like, you know, I see some sketches up behind you in your room and stuff. Like, you you obviously yeah. you just point to the art. <laughs> um, what's what's your experience there? Uh, so I I was really into fine art at school. Um, yeah, that was kind of my main thing. So I did, uh, I, I was kind of one of those people who does art and maths, mm. but only really at school. And then as soon as I left school, I was like, just pursuing art and making and doing stuff with my hands. Um, so there was a lot of like quite conventional fine art training, like going to life drawing classes and writing essays about like Dutch masters and stuff like that. Um, and I've done like Inktober a few times and was really into doing 2D art for quite a long time. And then mm. since coming out of school, I did, I like went into cabinet making. So I was like trained as a furniture maker and worked as that for a few years. Awesome. Um, so that's, yeah, and it's just like such another random skill. But <laughs> And like, beautiful skills too. I love this, like inking, <laughs> you know, inktober, participating in that cabinet making. Like it's, you know, these are all beautiful, so genteel. Artistic, you know, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, good fun. But there's, there, there's not a huge sort of application for that now because it's, it's good if you can get the clients, but there's like four clients in the country mm. to, who will pay that much, you know, if you want like a, a sideboard handmade by somebody for like i don't know three months of their time that's a lot of money mm, yeah so it's uh it was just it was kind of difficult to justify that as a business mm, yeah, it's <laughs> hard to compete pushing that. with uh, ikea it's just you know exactly <laughs> and uh, one of my friends now works for ikea so <laughs> you got a vendetta i reckon you could live stream on twitch cabinet making and, and you get enough followers that you could turn it into a business maybe totally that would actually be quite fun i mean lathe so work sanity. Yeah, everyone Lave loves Lave Lave Lave. Everyone watch that. Yeah, <laughs> um, so I, it's, it's interesting because like a lot of the stuff that you're doing now, like, um, you know, on your channel, you've got this really strong focus on procedural materials and, mm. um, and naturally geometry nodes. Like you pretty much live in Blender uh, 2.93 at this point, right? Like you don't even touch yeah. 2.92. Like you're done with That's that one. It's like, obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> it's already obsolete. Like you're happy to live with instability. How, how did you, so how did you get, cause you were, you're saying you'd stop doing math in, in high school. Right. And yeah, I think, I think a lot of people that watch, you know, this show and watch, you know, the channel, um, and certainly for myself as well, like I stopped at high school math too. I did one math course in university, but it was just like an introduction to, uh, logic. Like it, it was, that's all it was. So it was very basic stuff. And I just kind of stopped. I dropped math cause I was same thing. I was into filmmaking and I was into art and, and I just studied those things. Um, and it's not only until now that I think Blender is starting to, you know, bring all this node stuff, all this procedural stuff. And I'm starting to see the value in this that I'm going, actually, I really want to learn this. I want to, I want to know how mm. this stuff works. Um, how did you go about that process? How did you begin to translate, I guess, your, your gap? How, where did your knowledge gap start? Like, so when did you stop? Like, what was the highest level of math you did? And then how did you fill in the gaps with your, your work now as, as in Blender? Yeah. So in the UK, we have A-levels. Uh, so that for people up to the age of 18 um so that was kind of like trigonometry i think like i was so bad at it as well you know like trigonometric identities it's like sine over cos equals tan that's the only one i know apparently there's like 20 of these things um it's already but there's just right, exactly it's but it's so abstract the way they teach you in school is so abstract um and i, I just i kind of i want to i almost i almost have by this is kind of on my to-do list is to make a maths course for high school students, but using Blender, like nice. this is how you do it. Because I think Blender is almost maybe even is the best way to learn maths. Cause people ask me quite a lot, like, Oh, what reading should I do around maths or what channels should I go and look at? And there are some good maths channels out there and you can like 
you can go and learn from them, but I think you already need a foundation in sort of a foundational understanding or some kind of context to be able to say, oh, this bit of information, I can now add this to what I already know and it will make sense rather than just going picking up like, oh, this is what cross product does. So now you just know what cross product does. It's like it's meaningless information unless you have the context. I think anyway, I mean, obviously everybody learns differently, but I think for Blender, because if you take a middle gray and you add it to another middle gray and then you get a white and it's like, well, I can see that 0.5 is at plus 0.5 equals like a higher value. And obviously that translates to much more complex things like sign and cars and things. If you do that on displacement, you can properly see a sine wave. Or if you add it to something, then you can see it actually affecting something in real time. Um, and I'm a very visual person. So it's really important to me that I can kind of, yeah, translate it into a visual medium rather than just being like, oh, Modulo does this very abstract thing or Fraction just takes the, so like officially Fraction takes the fractional part of the number. So if you have 1.2, Fraction will give you the 0.2 part of it. Or if you have like 4.3, it will give you the 0.3 part of it. It will just ignore the integer. But in terms of actually using that, it's like Fraction is the one that repeats your gradient so if you want to tile a texture, you can just like put a vector math fraction on there. And that's kind of as much as you need to know when making shaders. But then if you then go and learn the maths and learn about that, then you're like, oh, now I understand it because I have that context. Mm. So I think, I know a lot of people approach it like, oh, I need to know the maths first before I can do the shaders or before I can do the geometry nodes or whatever else. But I would actually argue that you're going to, learn it so much better if you start doing these things because they're fun because they're playing and you're making stuff which is cool and also that people other people think is cool i think that's quite important to have that kind of motivation um and then when you come back and be like oh actually i can pick up this bit of maths it'll make you stronger as an artist but it'll also mean that you can learn the maths if you're not necessarily a mathematical person like i'm not really that mathematical naturally so <laughs> but you've, you've wrangled your way into understanding it. I think, I think what you're saying is dead on. Like math has always been for me, at least, uh, you know, it's such an abstract thing. Um, and you're dealing in such abstract ideas. And I think it takes a certain personality or interest to really latch hold of that and get excited about abstractions. And that excitement can propel you to learn. For me, it was, it was machine learning that got me interested in math again. So when I started reading about machine learning and realizing that, you know, these ideas, uh, you know, these sort of self-correcting algorithms or these, you know, re recursive things that could, could actually uh, iterate, you know, I'd already done a lot of work in programming and learning that, you know, because of just my interest in that world as well. And just seeing how those things fit together uh, was really exciting. And that's what got me starting to want to get back into it. And I remember I started watching a... Um, started doing the MIT open courseware, the YouTube course, the MIT's got a lot of great courses online for free and they have a linear algebra course. And so I started taking that because I was like, I need to, I wanted to begin to learn something that related to 3D, um, related to how it was all working. Like how are we rendering stuff to a screen? And um, and I, I just, it was so abstract. Like I couldn't understand, like I, I could follow along and I could do the operations and go, okay, well I can, I can multiply this matrix by this matrix, sure but I've got no idea why I've got to go columns and rows and then what's this thing that I get at the end and what, how is that relevant? And then they're like, the, the professor's like trying to explain it saying, you know, so it's obvious now that all of these are on the same plane. And I'm like, how is that obvious? Like, so I don't get this. Like, but then I jumped into Blender and I, I took a vertex. I remember this is like the aha moment for me. And I, I put the vertex at zero, zero and I, and I said, okay. And actually no, I moved it to like zero, one, zero or something like that. Anyways, and I moved it over and then I did, a matrix math operation on it and and i i put it manually typed in where the vertex should be now because i did the math and then it was like oh i see now it's like it's pointing in the i took these two vertexes and i did the math on their position and i get this one that's up here and it's like oh that's they're all on the same plane i get it because i can make a plane out of these and it was just such a great aha moment and um and i think you're right that being able to jump into blender and play with math visually is where it can start to stick i think for a lot more people who maybe don't want to have aren't interested in the abstractions but are excited by the practical use case and i guess that's kind of what i next thing i wanted to talk about too is 
Um, and I, by the way, I love your idea of doing this math course using Blender. Like I, if I can encourage you to do that in any way, please <laughs> let me do it. Cause I think that's just brilliant. Like it would be so useful. Everybody's learning online now. Like I just think it'd be so valuable. Um, but, uh, anyway, so in terms of where Blender's going, cause okay. Geometry knowns is, is on the scene. Everyone's getting excited. <laughs> uh, a lot, a lot of people have downloaded the experimental builds necessarily. So they haven't seen where it's headed, right? If they've watched yeah. your channel, they see where it's headed. Um, and uh, but it's it it's becoming obvious to me at least that uh, being able to use the vector math node is going to be just so valuable uh, if you can understand <laughs> the ideas going on behind it. It's just going to be so useful that I think there's going to be a lot of people going. I don't get this. It's frustrating, and I want to because I can see what these people are making with this. Um, and what, how do you see it? What do you see the future of Blender? Like, what do you, you know, just cast forward a year or two and what, what's it, what's it look like to you? I mean, oh, that's, it's such a difficult question because a year ago, I would have completely got this wrong, even though I was still being like, oh, I'm really interested in the Everything Nodes project. But then when I look at, cause I know Sverjok, which is like a procedural modeling add-on. Mm -hmm. um, I know that quite well. And the workflow in Svertrock is completely different to geometry nodes. So there's these two, and I, I think that's quite common for sort of all procedural modeling platforms. There's sort of two approaches. There's like the Houdini version, which is attributes, or there's the grasshopper version, which is lists. Um, and they're kind of both the same thing. Like an attribute is really just a list of values. So for example, when you have geometry nodes and you have a plane, uh, you have a position attribute and that position attribute contains four items, one for each corner of the plane. Whereas in the list workflow, a plane you would with just four take... vertices, right? You mean like, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. So in the, in the list, ver in the list way, you would just take your noodle in, and it would be containing four vectors. They wouldn't necessarily be vertices. They wouldn't necessarily be joined up or anything that comes as like a separate section. You would like take these vertices and you would join them up in a certain order. So it's, it's two very different ways of working. Um, and I think the list method is kind of a designer's point of view and the attribute version is an animator's point of view. And I think I always have to remind myself that Blender is an animation software first. Um, so where's it going? I mean, it's nodes. Everything is going to be nodes at some point, but that doesn't mean that it's only going to be nodes. I think a lot of people are scared of that as well. Like, oh, you can only make shaders that are really complex with nodes, but you can still technically make a shader with the material properties panel. Um, and it's going to be the same with, uh, with I think, a lot of other stuff. I, I don't know how integrated it's going to be. So with shaders, if you make something with the material panel, and you like click the little icon to the left of the input value, then it will let you sort of connect a node and it will build up a node network separately. What I would really love to see is 3D modeling um, create nodes live. So that way you would essentially have a history stack. So you would be able to say, oh, actually I probably shouldn't have done that extrude like 10 minutes ago, because that's messed up my geometry now. Um, so I would really love to see that. I don't know how integrated that's going to be, but I think for particles, we're going to see something similar. So there's going to be the node network, but I think we're still going to have the panel that you can go through a bit more linearly. Um, and I think that will have to generate the node network. Um, I don't know how they're going to go about doing animation. I keep hearing collection nodes as being the kind of the parallel to animation nodes. So animation nodes is an add-on by uh, Jacques Luca. Mm. Uh, who now works for Blender making the Everything Nodes project. So, oh, wow, cool. I didn't realize that he was involved. That's exciting. Yeah. He started Animation Nodes when he was 17 as well. Like, uh, it's just crazy. The number nice. of like young people. <laughs> no. Well, I think but <laughs> so that's motivated. really, that's the power of Blender. Like it's this open source package, this platform. I think it's, it's really clear. Like you look at Unreal, right? Getting behind Blender. Like uh, you look at Facebook now funding Blender. You yeah. look at... And the people that are funding Blender that are getting behind it, they're all the people that are trying to create virtual metaverses, right? So it's Unreal is, you know, they're, they're I'm telling you, like, I, if you notice, they've just bought out, um, what's the name of that game? It's like a, it's a game where you can make games. It's like Roblox, but it's not Roblox. It's another, I don't know if you've uh, seen this. 
It's on the Epic Game oh. Store. They just they just launched oh. it. But the idea is it's like a metaverse game where you can go in and you can create your own games and share them with friends and then you can socialize, right? Mm -hmm. That is going to be like Fortnite's going to be that, right? In I don't know how many years, they're definitely working on it. Like I, I would be so surprised if in five years time, Unreal Engine isn't this online metaverse thing where you're able to create games in a game environment that's the Fortnite, mm -hmm. you know, ecosystem, whatever. And uh, and there's gonna be a ton of people doing that, just like there are with Roblox right now. And and they need to have a platform that people can, you know, create things and model objects and create assets and you know, yeah. they're all jumping on Blender because Blender's open source and they see where it's going and it's the future generations that are going to be doing 3D stuff. They're the ones picking up Blender. They're learning Blender. And if Blender's good enough, they're just going to stay with Blender because, yeah, you know, the sure. rest of us, like the old hats like me, it's like we started with Maya and we've kind of progressed into Blender. Um, but there's no reason to go the other way. Um, not that I think tools you're, aren't seeing, good, but... you're seeing more demand as well because yeah. I'm, so I'm a Blender native. I've tried Maya and I've tried 3ds Max and I... I've tried a few other, and it's just, it's never really stuck. Like, I know it's like, there's this whole joke that like, oh, industry standard is like the kryptonite for Blender users because we just hate hearing industry standard because nothing about Blender <laughs> is industry standard. But then there's nothing about Blender that you can't work with like proper studio pipelines. You know, you can still have, because everything's like using USD or Alembic now anyway, so yeah. you import everything and then you just you process it and then you export it to the next person in the chain and it's fine. Um, so you don't, yeah, I think there's this kind of fallacy that Blender is not for, not for professionals. Like you're gonna, you're using Blender now, but one day you're going to graduate from it and you're going to start using a real piece of software. Yeah, um, that's not And I, th I think it's starting to become a bit less. Like we're seeing so many more, young people uh, especially and especially i mean there's like people at university now who were born after the millennium so all of these people who are like blender natives for their whole lives have now gone into the professional space or even as starting studios themselves so there's so much more demand for blender people and like i've been employed by studios because they've been transitioning to blender from another software like soft image or um i don't know maya or something like that and I, or I got a message from someone the other day saying that they were transitioning from 3ds Max and they were like an ArcVis studio. Um, so like proper companies, professional companies yeah. that are now picking up Blender as their like, that's their daily driver now. Mm. Um, so you get pulled in as like a Blender person, kind of as yeah. a consultant, which is a bit weird to be like, okay, I'm here to like fix your problems and I'm a child. And it's like, that's just a very strange kind of dynamic to navigate as well so that's right that's just cool. the mindset i think of like <laughs> like leaving university you kind of expect the world to view you in a certain way and then it, it takes a couple of years for you to realize that actually no like as soon as you leave <laughs> university you're just in the terrifying pool of survival <laughs> that everyone else is in and nobody sees age anymore everyone's just like <laughs> yeah. i just had to survive how can i find hope oh, okay here's someone i'll just get it you've got a youtube, youtube channel that's all that matters you know I, um I think it's a great point you're making because Blender is definitely, I know for me, like trajectory wise with my own career, like, you know, I'm using Blender now solely for all of my professional work. And, you know, my clients don't know, they don't, and they don't care. Like I was, yeah. I was doing a big agency job last week um, for some billboards uh, and it was, you know, I had to create this full, they wanted this full 3D scene and, uh, and I was working with a studio that was known for photo reel stuff right and they're real high-end studio uh, in in sydney and and i was sending them my renders right and and they were loving it they're like oh this looks fantastic i love what you did with the volumetrics there the cloud the smoke that's really cool in the scene let's go with that what they didn't realize was i was sending them renders out of eevee so i was using eevee <laughs> as a real-time renderer right and because i had the flexibility was just so great and and it looked good enough it was like i don't really need global illumination on this like you know and I don't have any noise in this image. Like that's because, and it was a billboard. So it's a massive image, right? It's a humongous yeah. image that would have taken forever in cycle. So, and that was one of the comments that came back to it. Just love how clean you've gotten this. Like there's no mm. noise in this 3d render. It's great. I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> Must have but, um, so long to render. Yeah, it's a, it took me days. Don't give me any changes. <laughs> I think, uh, but it's exciting. And I think you're right. People are starting studios and I think the way economics are going as well, like, um, you know, smaller studios are really what's viable. Um, 
in, 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 in all these different industries going forward. So it's going to be these like one, two, three man bands that are, you know, putting together, um, you know, these, these projects and stuff that are really going to mm-hmm. succeed. Um, but, um, yeah, it's interesting. And you're right as well that Blender doesn't necessarily have this, you know, it's not a terrifying node future. It should be a really liberating one. And, um, yeah, hopefully you're right. It'd be great if we got actual the hierarchy of creation happening, like when you created a, a a cube and extrude it, and you know have that history there to play with. I think that's yeah, that's really cool. Well, I mean, so sounds like uh, just to summarize this last bit that we talked about. Sounds like for me, what you're saying. Tell me if I'm right. For people to really learn and to to begin to approach, you know, they might be intimidated about where Blender's going. They're intimidated by the mm-hmm. math. They're intimidated by the nodes. What you're saying is. Don't don't sweat it. Jump in and and start start finding patterns. I guess maybe is that a good way to frame it. Find patterns, visual patterns, where you know that okay, if I use modulo with a color ramp and and I export it, like it's gonna look like this. This is what this math operation gives me. This visual effect, um, mm-hmm. and begin to build a library of those in your head that you can rely on and and then that's about it like is that kind of it or do you feel like there's something missing there as well that people should be adding in i think um i think shaders are a lot easier to learn than geometry nodes um at the moment so i think yeah i would definitely go in and be like like pick a math operation and even this is what i do quite a lot is i will sort of hypothesize what i think is going to happen and sort of I will, I will then go and do it. So I might be like, oh, if I divide this by like pi, and, and this happens quite a lot, actually. Um, I will, if I know that I want something to be sort of round, I know that it's it's going to be something to do with pi or sine or cos. Like I can throw something into the mix and something will happen. And then from there, I can like try something else or or maybe I'll come up with a really cool result. But um, so like something that was, a couple of months ago, somebody was like, oh, I need to make this plane into a sphere with re- vector displacement. And I was like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I know how to make a cylinder, though. So if I take a grade, this is a free tip for everybody. Free tip, if you have, okay. <laughs> If you have a, a, a number range from 0 to 2 pi, uh, or, and when I say a number range, you can also use like a gradient. So this is going to work for uh, geometry nodes if you use if you manage to pull out a number like that, or if you use a gradient in a shader, and you put it through sine and you put it through cos, and then you put your cos into x and your sine into y, it's going to give you a circle. It's just it's just how math it's it's just magic, right? It's the maths because uh, it's because of like the phase offset between a sine and a cos wave. When you say a, put them together, what do you mean? So let's talk about it from notes. So we got a color ramp, let's say, and we've got black, and then. Instead of white, we've gone in, we've changed the vibrancy, and we've and we've turned it up to <laughs> the equivalent of two pi. So you get our calculator, we multiply to... pi, and we multiply. Let me two dictate. Two. Okay, so we've got you've got a UV, so zero to one, uh, separate x y z. So then you've got your individual uh, x y and z components. Take your x, take a math node, multiply it by two pi. Mm-hmm. So now you have a zero. You started with zero to one, and now you've got zero to two pi, and then you put it through a math node to give you, uh, change, change that to cosine. So now the cosine is going to output minus one to one in a certain order, right? So it's going to be like starting at minus one and then come up to one and then back to minus one. Um, and then in parallel to that, if you use a sine, then it's going to start at zero and then go up to one, back down to minus one and then up to zero. So it's like 90 degrees out of phase. But then if you now take a combine X, Y, Z, and you plug those into the x and the y, it's going to describe a circle. Mm. So you can do little bits of maths like that. And I would never know how to kind of just work that out. Like I, if I didn't see somebody do that at some point, then I would never know this. And I don't have the math skills to like just interpret that from seeing yeah, graphs and in, stuff. Intuit that, as they say in math. Exactly. <laughs> but then if... Yeah, it, it, that's like one of those things which is like, oh, this is kind of complex, but at the same time, it's like it's one thing that I need to remember. And now I know how to make circles. So then when somebody was like, oh, I know how to make a cylinder, but how do you make it into a, a sphere? And it's like, well, I've got a third axis, right? I've got the Z, yeah, got the Z I've made the X and the there. Ys. Yeah. So if I do something with like pi or two pi and cosine or cos, like sine, and just like mix it in some way, 
then I come up with something. And like miraculously, like the third try, I came up with a sphere. And it was like, that's just using some basic tools and knowing that like circles are basically pi. Just that's what you need to remember, circles are pi. And then you can just you can just do magic with that. Like there's and so that's little that you in, actually need to build in a blender, right? You can just type pi. Like, I mean, you could do yeah. shorthand. Yeah, yeah, pi. Or if you want two pi, it's tau, T A U. That's yeah, nice that's right. shortcut. Nice. So um, it's built in there. Yeah. So the, the majority of maths is just like uh I don't know, addition and subtraction and a bit of multiplication. And then you have like a few times that you use more complex stuff like fraction or modulo or snapping if you want it to be like stepped. But then beyond that, it's like you do have all of these additional functions, but I don't think I've ever used like arc sign in mm. a shader. I, it's it's there and it scares people away from using the basic arithmetic. And I think that's a shame because you can get so much utility out of the basic stuff um, without ever having to go to the higher stuff. And again, stuff like um, oh, doing tiles or something like that. You could do it with fraction or you can do it with ping pong, but you could just as easily take your gradient and then put it through a color ramp and just put like a flag in the middle at, set to white and then have your two ends set to black. And then you have your linear gradient in between that. So there's so many different ways of doing stuff and you can take the more visual way with like a color ramp, which is less optimal. Whereas a map range or doing it with maths is always going to be more optimal because you're using one thing instead of RGB. So it's like three times cheaper to do it. Right. Maths instead notes. of a vector of three numbers, it's just dealing with a single value. Because it's exactly. map range isn't a vector product. It doesn't do vectors. No, it's just, a vector a, math? it's just flowing. There is mm, no, there is not actually. There's no I have made one, yet. but uh, <laughs> you have made one. Oh man! <laughs> you just just have your own node groups to do things, yeah. but stuff like that. When by the time you get to the end of November and you've been doing nodes for a month, and it's like, I definitely use some of these tools like on multiple days. <laughs> so you just end up with like a whole new tool set, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that's actually a great point. And uh, maybe maybe we just get to mention because everybody may not be aware of November. I mean, I assume most people know about it, but if you don't know about it. Uh, November, what is it and how can people find out about it? November is great. November is great. It's the, like a month long challenge. Supposedly you do it every day, but there's really no pressure. Um, the majority of us do it with shaders in Blender. So it's kind of the month of vector displacement. It was crazy actually, because I followed it last year in uh, 2019. And it was like Luca Rude and Gabe and uh, Simon Thomas doing incredible work. But then this year, it was like every day we were expected to do the same as like Simon Thomas's best work from the year before. So like yeah. the standards were like pushed so high. It was they ridiculous. way up this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit intimidating. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> this is nuts. Yeah. I had a few people message me like, oh, I was so ready to start in November. And then when I actually came to it, I was just like, I was just too scared. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get involved. It's like, oh, it's uh, such a good learning opportunity. Though. Like do something every day for a month, like whatever it is, even if it's just like, I don't know, just doing like spinning plates, you know, by the end of the month, you're going to be so good at it. And it's exactly the same with like making shaders. So it's, yeah, you get all of these prompts, right? You get 31 prompts for November and yeah. then they just, it'll be something like scales or Where do you find those, those, those prompts at? So is it at, on the, Twitter or is it the Instagram account? Uh, yeah. So the Twitter channel, Twitter account, uh, November they do share each day they share like which day it is um, but they have a website as well where they sort of collate the list of all of them um, or for anybody who was on my discord server we have like quite a strong uh, procedural emphasis so there was like everybody was posting in the November challenge channel on your, there. your discord would have been a fun place to be during November I imagine Wait, how do you people find your discord do you have a link on your YouTube page or uh, you know, I don't think I do. Uh, it's linked underneath all of my videos, though. Oh, it's on my Twitter in my Twitter bio. So in the in the description of the, uh, the yes. Video. And what's your Twitter? I always handle? put it quite high up. Uh, Twitter handle is Erindale underscore X Y Z. Um, Very nice cool. and easy to find. Yeah, I like what Ellie McQueen says in chat. November is the best and worst month of the year. I think that sums it up for all of us. <laughs> it's definitely the best. Yeah, everybody in my Discord was jumping on it as well, uh, and it was great because like we had all kinds of. We've got you know huge range of skill levels uh in mm -hmm. my discord and um 
but it was awesome because it kind of didn't matter. Everybody was still, it's almost like they felt safer in the Discord to share their mm. stuff, um, which, which is great. Like, I really try to encourage that, at least on my Discord. It's like, you know, it doesn't matter what your skill is. Yeah. Share it, share it, share it. And it's a bit, you know, it's a smaller social network, so it's a bit safer. Uh, and uh, I think that's great. So, yeah, if you haven't already, you know, can really consider it. Find a Discord somewhere that you could join. Check out Arendelle's and uh, jump into it, especially for November, and just play. Have fun with it. Because this is the point I think we're driving at is everybody pretty much universally everybody is intimidated by math like mm -hmm. you know it's 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 very intimidating um and when you when you begin to realize that you can just have a few little tools in your pocket so a few little node setups that you've learned think about it that way think about it don't you have to go learn math but go learn just a few node setups that use math in interesting ways so you know know how to use you know two pi like splitting out the xyz use two pi and bring them together uh, when you brought together, I, I am curious. So when you brought together the X and the Y, so your X was sine and your Y was cosine, and you, mm -hmm. and you mixed those numbers with a math node, what was the operation with a, that you used? Did you just add That was just with a combine X, Y, Z. So the combine X, Y, Z lets right, you I see what you're saying. Right, take you the three. So you're exactly not actually doing a math operation. Vector. You're just turning it back into, yeah, cool. To a vector, and you exactly. Used, and you brought the Z over with no no change. Um, yeah, just, just a zero in that case. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a great example, right? Just knowing that you can do that and then you can just pull that tool out and reuse it, and reuse it, and reuse it. Um, exactly. And you'll find that you're going to start being able to do this stuff. And I think that's going to be empowering going forward because you're going to be able to do some really, really cool things once Geometry Nodes really gets off the ground, towards, especially towards mm -hmm. the end of this year. I think into 2021, we're all going to be doing this a lot. And so... Yeah, we might need two November Novembers. I don't know. I think I think there's going to need. <laughs> uh, we'll have to have because like the whole shader Vember, like that's really what November has been for me. Is about touch shaders. I think we're going to need a geometry Vember. You know, well, like we have materials. Oh, so mate materials and November are six months apart. So it's like that you've just recovered, right? right. Nobody just, sleeps just... for November. <laughs> So you recover in time for May Terry. Just as a, just as a qualifier, I never participate. Like I never do November. I've never done it. I have no intention of doing it. Like I'm just <laughs> you'll do it. Like, too busy. Like forget it. We'll make you. I, I give that time to my kids. That's my plan. But um, that's really it's really cool. Um, and and really, uh, I think yeah, it's just really empowering and helpful. I think thinking about that. Um, so let, let's change gears a little bit just for a second. So while we've got a little bit of time left in the show. I, I wanted to talk a bit because I like to talk about how to survive as an artist. Um, mm. And because, you know, we're all artists here, uh, whether or not you realize it, but if you, you pick up Blender even casually and you make an image, bam, you're an artist. And um, it's, uh, it's difficult to find your way, um, you know, how do you get to a point where you get to make your own work um, and, and get to live in this? And I guess, what have, what have been your experiences with this so far? So, you know, you've got a YouTube channel, you've left university, you're doing some freelance um, talk me through it. Like, how are you finding the experience? It's uh, so I'm in a very protected environment because I am able to live at home with my parents. So, um, at, I mean, for this year, I am actually paying a second rent because I signed a contract just before COVID struck on a house. So I do technically have a second address in Manchester at the moment, but generally speaking i'm like pretty protected so i know that i can take more risks i could take a month off or whatever to be like okay i just want to push my personal practice a little bit further um so it's it's not lost on me that i'm very privileged in that way but i think for i, I think there is so much demand out there at the moment i think the the industry gets quite bad rap for being like oh there's no jobs there's no jobs but actually if you're passionate and interested and you're putting your work out there, I think that's a really important thing as well. It's just like be visible, be the person that people think of when they're looking for somebody or when they when they get a new job and they're like, oh, I, I've, I've seen somebody's work and it kind of got me in the right direction for this. If you just happen to be sending that person an email at the same time being like, I am interested in working with you, then they're going to just, from my experience, they're just going to say yes. Like, it's quite rare for me to email somebody and then to just give me a flat out no. Like it might be that they don't have a project which is appropriate, but they'll keep me on the books for later or, you know, that like quite a few times. So it's just been like, yeah, this jump in, see what you can offer us in this work. 
so I think a lot of it is, and obviously like putting yourself out there online, I have the benefit of a YouTube and a t- kind of Twitter presence that means that when people interact with me, I come with credibility in advance. So people kind of understand that I have, um, I just saw in the chat, Archie was saying I never emailed him. I saw that too. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, I think a lot of people have to be a bit more forward with their portfolio, but at the same time, um, the internet gives us all of those avenues. And especially now with COVID, people have learned that they can work at home and studios have realized that it's saving them money and also making them more money. Like their employees are more productive because they're not being distracted by people in the studio and they can just get their head down and they can maybe work at hours outside all, of the uh, 9 to we're 5. We're all raging introverts, right? We just want to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been really liberating for me because when I was working with the studio last year, I was doing, uh, we start at 10, finish at 6. And I don't really naturally follow that rhythm. So I would have a very slow morning and then I'd be like really going for it. Like I'd be going hard and then they'd be like, okay, we've got to lock up. We need to go. Everybody wants to go home. And it would be like, well, I'm in my flow now. Whereas now that I'm at home and I can, you know, if somebody comes to me with a job, I'm I'm probably making less money per hour because instead of doing eight hours, I'll do 10 or I'll do 12. Yeah. But at the same time, I'll finish the work. Like I'll get to the end of it and it'll be great. Like I'll do my best work and I'll be, like I'm very much my harshest critic. Mm-hmm. So I think people are realizing that people can work from home. So don't be afraid of, applying to a studio or a role who's like in a different part of the country or in a different country you know you can make yourself useful to people basically anywhere at this point so like quite a lot of the work that i've been doing recently has been for people on uh, on the continent on in europe whereas i obviously live in the uk so hundreds of miles thousands of miles between us um, but it's not ever been a problem and me sending them emails at four in the morning perhaps i should be embarrassed about that but they're getting the work <laughs> they're getting it done so good. yeah i don't know i don't know, i think turning it into a business is a bit of a daunting thing like i think the way that you convert people to um and obviously it's not about turning people into money that's that would be a very uh I don't know, that would be the wrong view of doing it. Like we both want to teach people, but yeah. at the end of the day, there's also like shelter and food is nice. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like kids think I so too. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what's what's your approach for converting people? How do you go from Yeah, here is a person who's watching my video to here is a person who is able to or prepared to put money on the mm. table for this content? I think it's a mindset thing. You, you have to understand that, you know, in, in, in the online economy, it's, it's, uh, there's such a wide range of people with different financial situations and also to different like currency values. So, you know, you live in a country like Australia, like where I live, you know, and you, you, our currency doesn't stack up compared to Europe or, you know, the U S or in any of these other places, like it's, everything's always like twice as expensive for us if we're trying to engage with those services, you know, so you have to think a bit harder about it, you know, um, cause we don't, we don't, you know, our currency is half as valuable, but it doesn't mean we get more of it, you know, <laughs> I, don't get, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get twice as much Australian dollars as, you know, but, um, so it's, it's understanding. I think that if you if you want to bring value, you have to begin to understand economics, and um, and you have to think about economics. I think as an artist, it's an important thing to think about. And when I mean by economics, I mean the dynamic of value and and allowing things to have value. As an artist, you're creating images, right? And those images have value. They value to you, but they have value to other people as well. And you have to protect that value. And that's been a really difficult thing for me to learn. I think and and progress with. Um, and YouTube's forced me into it um, to begin thinking about it, and Patreon even more so. Uh, so a good example with Patreon. When I first started with Patreon, like I was, um, you know, I I was doing these these long running series where I'd do like a ten episode series, and we'd make this really complex scene. And then if you became a member on Patreon, then you'd get access to the project files of that series, and you'd get access to some bonus tutorials. And so I was trying that whole like some contents 
paywalled some contents available for everybody. Um, and that worked for some people. Like that was a really good way to, I guess, create an opportunity to support the work that I was doing for the people that wanted to and, and could not wanted to, because a lot of people that want to, that can't, um, but the people that were in a position to, um, and, and I was kind of adding value, but then it was difficult because I wanted to sell that series as an educational pack, like on the blender market or elsewhere. Um, and I, I, I was giving it away on Patreon for a lot less, you know, cause you would join for, you know, sorry. and then it got even more complicated when I started doing kind of just random tutorials and I was giving those project <laughs> files on, on, you know, Patreon as well. And I was looking at everybody else's Patreon and they were doing stuff where it was like, you know, you join at this like $7 level or something right in the middle and you got everything. You got all the project files, all the materials and assets. And I realized that like, if you do that approach, which is, I guess there's nothing wrong with that approach, but what's happening, like the reality of what's happening is that every time you put a new thing available that people can get for that same price, you devalue all of those things a little bit. And then you do it again and it's all worth a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. Until, you know, you sign up for, you know, seven bucks and you get thousands of project files. And now none of those project files have much value. And that there's a two-way street to that. Because I think that, you know, for you as an artist, um, you're you're missing out on a lot of um, opportunities there to, to have a stronger, um, more supported, like, income stream. But also, too, for everybody that's getting those files, they mean less to them. They're, they're like... All right. Well, I've got thousands of files now, so that, you know they don't mean as much to me. Yeah, I'm not even going to look at half of them. Like I'm kind of, and so I switched the model at that point to just doing, um, you know, if you become a patron at, you know, the the second level from my and my Patreon, you're getting access to the project files from this month and last month, and that's it. And each each month, I you know retire the files and I put in a new lot, and I have to manage that. It's a little bit of extra work to manage, but. It just means that everybody's getting the same thing. So if you become a patron and you stay a patron for five months, you, you're going to get five months of value. And if someone joins on the sixth month, they're not going to get that five months of value. They're just going to get, you know, the same thing. And so it all kind of mm -hmm. balanced out. And then it gave me the opportunity to then go, okay, now I can make these little packs and I can sell them because they're no longer available on Patreon. And now they've got, and they've retained their value because this group paid this money to get these. So, you know, I can say that, well, it's still worth that. Um, yeah. So it's something I'm still learning about, and I think it's a really interesting thing to think about, especially now that we have NFTs, which is the the big elephant in the room uh, at the moment. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, you know, a little PSA for everybody out there: if you're not, if you're hearing lots about NFTs, um, I, I don't um, don't get into it. when trying to make money. Like I would really discourage people from trying to flip NFTs and stuff. Uh, it's a really crazy environment right now and whenever people are really mm. hyped FOMO is a really dangerous thing you don't want to miss out and people are jumping onto it and they're trying to buy these things and flip them and there are people making lots of money but it's just so risky like it's just but that aside where it's going is suddenly now online art has the ability to retain value because of the economics of it right they're, they're, we, you can have a rare unique piece of art that is attached to something that says this is the genuine version of this JPEG or the genuine version of this um, and, and I think that's going to be really helpful and valuable for all of us going forward in the gears to come once, once the noise calms down and mm -hmm. sort of, you know, all this stuff, uh, settles out. So I think, yeah, learning about economics and thinking about it's really, really valuable. Um, but uh, I don't know, does that make sense? Is that, that was my little yeah, diatribe. Definitely. I think my, my approach to Patreon has always been so, um, just not a very businessy approach <laughs> i've always just done it as like oh, i don't want it i don't want to put anything behind a paywall i want to make everything available to everybody because ultimately i'm doing this because i want to teach people so as soon as i put something behind a paywall it's like people who can't afford that or people who are you know un below an age when you would have a credit card or a paypal or whatever yeah suddenly you're taking that content away from them which i think is uh it's kind of like against what i want to do but then at the same time i want to make a business so the, i've been sort of like slowly turning the thumb screw and being like oh, i want to just mm -hmm. make a little bit more of this like paid so it's like okay now tutorial videos the tutorial project file will go behind a paywall like you just need to pay the and i think my bottom tier is like one dollar a month like it's mm -hmm. it's basically nothing yeah well, it's basically nothing for a person in like the uk mm -hmm. um although i know that that's actually still quite a cost for some people 
It's a lot for and us then, in Australia. I mean, that's oh, <laughs> it's like a week of food. From, oh, look, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, so, well, I mean, well, the thing that you're pointing out too, which is also really valid, and it's, I don't know if I'd call it a business model, but it's definitely viable, is the idea of people supporting you just because they like what you're, you're doing. Like, there's a lot of people on my Patreon um, and I'm sure you've seen this too, that are a part of it, not because of what they're getting or anything that's paywall. They're there because they really like what I'm doing and they're like, I want to find a way to support you. I just love your channel. Let's, can I give you money yeah. on a monthly basis? Because I know you need that to pull it off. There's a really good argument there for going, all right, maybe we don't need to worry about this whole paywall business. And, you know, I, I struggled with that too at the start and same kind of thing, turn the thumb screw and finally decide, look, I've got to I've got to try. And I think that's maybe the thing. You have to experiment. You have to be willing to experiment. Don't be afraid to change your Patreon tiers. You know, don't be afraid to change <laughs> up your YouTube channel. Don't be afraid to try things. Um, I think it's really valuable to experiment. But uh, but I hear I you. One of my yeah. one of my like New Year's resolutions was to start selling things for money. Because every time I've put out a product or a, a tool or something for shaders or, you know, now geometry nodes as well, it's like, I'll put it up, but I'll put it up for free. Like people can just donate. It's on Gumroad. People can choose to put in some money, and that's that's always really kind. Like I always feel nice when somebody does that. But then I look at this, and it it kind of comes in two two sides because I look at all of the people who've downloaded. Um, so I, I like I have a a procedural wood shader that like four thousand people have downloaded, and I think if each one of those had paid, like the five dollars that i could have put it out for or you know you see some procedural shaders out there for like thirty dollars as well and that's not really that uncommon um so on the flip side you obviously wouldn't have as many people getting it but on the other side you would have the money for it but then i see as well you know gumroad's really good for it because you get a mailing list like you suddenly have a standing audience of like ten thousand plus people just somewhat passively like i haven't ever pushed a mailing list but now i have people who i can like communicate mm -hmm. with be like here's a new product here's a new bit of contact here's a new course whatever and push stuff out there and be like you know starting to convert people in, in a different avenue um yeah it's difficult it's, it's difficult to balance the like the educational with putting stuff behind paywall because yeah i don't know i i do i feel weird about putting stuff behind a paywall when it's educational content because it's mm -hmm. uh totally. i learned blender for free that's just how it's always been for me and that's kind of one of the great things about blender is that it's been this kind of this free thing this whole time and it's that's brought so many people into the 3d space you know our industry would be so much less um kind of divergent if if it was just autodesk people or if it was just like yeah. max on 3d people so yeah i don't know difficult yeah, one to balance but then obviously uh, nfts as well that's uh it's a hot topic at the moment. There's a lot of conflicting information, but I think that it's, I know there's a lot of people arguing against the artificial scarcity of digital works because it's like, oh, you, it's digital. You can just copy as much as you want, but it's like, you can, you still can, you know, you can go onto these listings and find the original content and just download that file. It's there, it's in public totally. space. But the ownership, that's like the important thing because now somebody can yeah, retain the value, like you were saying that's that's massive as a digital content creator that's a huge thing that's like a luxury to be able to sell something and have somebody own it without going through the rigmarole of setting up contracts and mm. doing all like the commission commissions and contracts is just not a good way to make money Be yeah. just yeah totally all right it's definitely going to be it's a technology to begin learning about it's, it's kind of how i talk about nfts sure. it's like now is the time to just begin learning about it like and when I say learn about it, like don't don't go into YouTube and start watching, you know, <laughs> you know, top ten NFTs to invest in now. You know, <laughs> it's just so much hype. Like, just go learn about the blockchain. Just figure out what it is because it's it's going to impact all of us, and it's going to be a major part of our lives. And when you begin to understand why, and you see that, um, you, you I think it's it is kind of empowering. You go, oh, cool, I can see how this is going to be good. Like, you know, I minted my first NFT the other day to figure out how to do it. Like, I just was like, I just want to, I don't understand what's happening. I'm going to go on, and I um I minted two of them, not to sell them. Well, I mean, they're up for sale because I had to do that to get verified or whatever. But um, it was a really educational process. But there's also this something that was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Like, I, you know, I've got something now that's unique, that's my own stuff, and it's sort of 
I don't know. It, it's weird. Like it's, it's, there's a whole mental process. I think that people are going to go through as they begin to learn this. Um, mm. And uh, especially I think once the, I mean, the, the problem is it's associated with cryptocurrency and there's just so much hype around that. And it's really only going to get worse. Like I think the hype is just going to get a <laughs> lot worse over the next like three years. I think it's just going to be insane. Um, but there I will be a worse point in noting. time. Yeah. With like NFTs and crypto, the distribution of wealth is basically the same as the distribution of wealth outside crypto. It's That's easy right. to look at it and be like, wow, Beeple made 69 million. Yeah. But then the, so did, you know, like Rupert Murdoch. Exactly. It's just the, the <laughs> yeah. specific people who make lots of money and the vast majority of people lose money. And yeah, I think it's... for artists doing the whole like gas gas fees at the moment, like, and I'm like, I want to emphasize like just at the moment, because it is the current technology it's going to change even in like a year it's going to be different um but like for now most artists are losing money because they're paying the gas fees and they're paying yeah for other artists work because they're like oh i want to get in this and i want to buy somebody's yeah. work and i want to support them a collection yeah yeah exactly it's, it's um, a bit of a cycle i think um but it's not i think yeah i think it's it's you can go easily two ways with it you can be just like so against it that you just ignore the whole thing I think there's some value in there and it's, it is going to be relevant for us, um, you know, as, as a way of having some kind of income in the future for, for artists. So it's definitely, definitely put on your radar, but don't, don't get caught up in FOMO. No, just put that out there. Right now. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about being missing. Don't worry about missing out. Um, let's talk about, you've got, this, go anywhere. you've got this new, uh, product. Um, let me put a, I do. Uh, is this a paid product? The, the course. Mm-hmm. It is indeed. It is. Uh, there you go. In the chat, I just put a link to it. So tell us about what this uh, is. Thanks so much. Uh, so uh, this week is, there's like a launch week special on it at the moment. So it's currently $7. Um, just launched it but like it's yesterday, right? Like literally last night. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, it's, it's part of a larger course. Um, the Blender Creative course is, uh, so Canopy Games did a, big blender course a few years ago and this is basically the update for it so this one is for the blender 2.9 x version so if you're using blender now this is the one which is going to be relevant and it's the goal for the the overall course is uh for it to teach you everything that blender can do like every part of blender is covered it's ridiculous um so i was brought in just to do the uh, procedural shaders part and i i don't it's kind of it's just a bit of good fun but it does teach you as well. So if you're new to doing procedurals or if you just want to brush up or if you aren't sure if you have the foundations in place, it's kind of, this is the course that that, I, that I've made that I think is the one that is valuable, that has the information that's valuable. So from the very beginning, it takes you through like, here is the node editor and here's the things in the node editor and how to find them and the shortcuts to use. And then it takes you through like making some basic materials all the way up to making a sort of a tile material with maths, so, you know, actually using maths on coordinates and not using like an image texture at all. You're just bringing in the uh, like the UV coordinates at the beginning, and at the end of it, you have like this proper PBR material with reflections, and like it's configurable, and you can change the size of the tiles and what kind of like bevel they have on the sides. So it's yeah, it just kind of takes you up to a level where you can start. It's like a jumping off point where right? you go from nothing to the edge of the diving board and then it's for you to explore really there's going to be more parts in the future and we had to cut quite a lot of it just because it was we kind of reached the the time limit for one section um and i think it it was kind of a round amount of information in here as well so there will be some future parts which like go into um more of the like displacement and more complex kind of reactive materials so, for example, like if you would put a metal material on a specific thing, then it would wear the edges based on the geometry. Um, so that's not in this one because this one's like an introduction to procedural textures. Whereas in the next section, it's going to be kind of more, and then there's going to be more, basically further and further. Um, yeah, and I'm toying with a geometry nodes course as well. But it's a little bit early in the development at the moment. Yeah. There's so mm -hmm. much changing every day. Like I've been emailed twice today saying that there's a new version of Blender to download. So it's like, <laughs> it's just too much. <laughs> they're, they're moving fast. Well, let me encourage yeah. you, encourage everybody to go check out that course. I think um, this is actually a really good example of, I think, 
the way to approach this stuff uh, is from a business sense is in terms of if anyone out there is trying to figure out how do you be an artist online. So I think Aaron, you know, you, you, you've, you're adding so much value to the community for free. Like oh, thank it's you. incredible the value you bring on your channel. And it's not like you're going to stop doing that. You're going to continue doing that. And yeah. I, you know, I just wanted to say, just put it out there in, in the internet, you know, it is okay <laughs> for you to sell a product. Like it's okay for you to sell some training. Um, and people need to hear that. I, I saw, uh, somebody earlier, um, mentioned, you know, that as soon as you try and paywall stuff, you, you go through imposter syndrome. And I think imposter mm -hmm. syndrome is something we all face. And especially, uh, it, when you're an artist doing stuff online, because you're solo, like you, you don't have a team, you don't have a marketing person to make a decision and say, this is how we're going to push out your product. And it's very, it's hard. It's raw because you get negative comments. You get people that, that say horrible stuff to you online <laughs> and you're exposing yourself to that. And, um, but, uh, but I think that, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that what you're already doing foundationally is in the ethos of, you know, the Blender community. It's this free open source thing. It's same for me. I learned Blender online for free through YouTube. And I think that the stuff on your channel, people can watch and learn and, they can learn Blender for free. Like you're already doing that. You're already doing Blender for free. And so I think everyone really appreciates that. And so that's where you've got room for things like Patreon. You've got room for things like a paid course because people can go, cool, this guy is already bringing so much value. I, you know, I'm excited to, to get behind him. And, uh, or even just, I mean, some people aren't excited about getting behind you. They just want to learn. And they're excited to like <laughs> yeah. go buy a, buy a course that's made specifically about a topic that, you know, isn't on an ad covered service like YouTube. Like <laughs> there's value in that, like getting stuff without ads. So. Um, and I'd say to the community, everybody that's watching this and, and everybody that's listening, oh, and everybody's listening too, just so you know, um, sorry, I want to read out that link so that you can find it if you don't see it. It'll be in the show notes as well for the podcast. So, but um, it's, uh, it's canopy.games slash P slash procedural dash materials dash in dash blender. So go check that out. Um, but I, let me say to the community too, you know, I think it's really important to remember that, um, you know, all of us are... Uh, really trying our best to, um, to, to maintain, um, a real positive attitude around all this stuff and to, to do, to do a great job bringing stuff that really adds value. And all of us really want to teach. We enjoy teaching. That's why we're here. Um, but we're going to get it wrong. And so we appreciate, I guess, the grace that you give us when we, when we do get it wrong. <laughs> uh, and, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a really lovely community. I think the Blender community surrounded. Them, yeah, so. for sure. Well, Aaron, it's been, I'll oh, go ahead. Sorry. With your, I think your and my Discord, like to the the idea of community. I think like when you watch YouTube videos, or if you just like you browse the Facebook pages a little bit, it's easy to see community as like a like community, like it's just people in general, without really having a feeling of community. But then when you actually join like somebody's Discord community, and it's like an actual community, like we're all pals and we all hang out and like chat yeah. and voice chat and we all share our work and all the time, and like you get to know people. Like, yeah, I would, uh, just for anybody listening, I would recommend joining some Discord communities totally. about like Blender yeah. because those specific interest groups interest groups are out there. And uh, yeah, I think that's really valuable in your learning as well. It's just to be around people who are going in the same direction. That's right. And you, and you recognize people. It's nice. Like, you know, just looking at chat, like every little icon, it's like, I know all these people. Like, this is a fun little group, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I know David S. I know Vincent 3DC. I know... You know, I am Patricio and, uh, you know, all the uh, the people that show up to all the streams and stuff and, and you get to know each other and, and on the discords, you can you can build relationships with people that are doing the same stuff. And it's really encouraging because mm -hmm. you got to you got to look after yourself, you got to look after your mental health. You got to be, you know, in a position to really, you know, encourage one another. So and uh, oh, thanks. Sorry, Charim, for the, the super chat. Appreciate appreciate mm -hmm. you guys throwing that towards us. Um, I'll find a way to share that with you, Aaron. Um, and uh, <laughs> anyways, I am. Um, Really want to thank you, Aaron, for giving us your time for coming on today to the show. It was Thanks just so much such for a pleasure me. to talk to you um, and uh, just hear, yeah, how you're wrestling with these things and thinking through it, and uh, and also to what you're, you know, what you're focusing on in the future of Blender. I think it's a very exciting thing to to think about and and talk about. So, um, mm. and thank you for yeah, running can, these podcasts yeah, as well. Like, it's so pleasure. interesting hearing the one with Mark and last week and. Yeah, cool. The more to come. So, well, if you have any recommendations of other people to talk to, let me know. Everybody in comments, mm -hmm. you know, send me links. Say, hey, look, have you seen this channel or this person? Um, I'd love to just keep keep mining this and see how far we can go with it. So, um, and also as a reminder, everybody, you can uh, I actually now find it on all major podcast services. So, if you want to just listen to this and you want to watch it on YouTube, 
Um, you can find it on Spotify and uh, Apple and Google and all those places. So have a look, find your podcast service of choice and check it out. Um, where can people find you, Aaron, if they want to check out more of your stuff? Uh, YouTube is probably the best place because that's where you will find my stuff. Like and subscribe, uh, like and subscribe. <laughs> So uh, just Arendelle on YouTube or uh, spell it out for everybody that's, like. that's listening in case they don't. How do you spell e Arendelle? E-R-I-N-D-A-L-E. So just Arendelle. Um, and then, yeah, Twitter, I post a lot of like tech demos or just like I've tried this thing and it's kind of cool. Um, so I post like a few times every day something which I've made. Um, so that's Arendelle underscore X, Y, Z. And awesome. uh, yeah. Great. Stuff. You can check it out. Also, just a shout out to Just Three D Things in chat. Go check out his channel too, on YouTube. He's another math whiz that's doing some really cool <laughs> yeah. stuff. We'll have to get you on the show. Just Three D Things. Would you like that? Let me know. Uh, anyways, um, and yeah, you can find uh, all my stuff at C Bailey Film on YouTube. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at the same handle. And uh, yeah, all that stuff. Go check it out. Links in the description. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron, for your time. Very kind of you to share oh, it with thank us. You and uh, your insights as well. And all the best with the future and your course and all the things you're doing. We'll have to get you on again sometime if you're up for it. And uh, yeah, of course. continue to watch your channel grow and learn more about nodes and math. So <laughs> get back to work, teach us some more stuff. We'd all appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Cheers great. very much. Well, thanks everybody. We'll end it here, but uh, we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching.